I grew up in a home where Arabic and English uh, danced uh, with each other constantly. And there were always these wonderful phrases and uh, combinations that were brought together through those translations and then made certain expressions possible. And, you know, to the end of her life, my mom would uh, say Trader's Joe as the name of the, of the um, supermarket. Yeah. And we always corrected her, you know, when I was young, you know, I can't, I don't know. I wish I had asked my mom, you know, what it is that made that, made her say it that way. I'd like to imagine that it, it may have come about because of her experience um, having grown up in, um, in you know, colonial contexts. Um, and um, perhaps at some level refuse, refusing the gesture of naming Trader Joe. And so saying Trader's Joe flips it around in a way that denaturalizes uh, the agency in a way. And uh, so I'd like to think that her articulation of the name was held together by a different set of relations that made it possible. Hi everybody, this is Literature, Language, Culture, a dialogue series. I am your host today, C.R. Grimmer, and our guest is Anise Bawarshi. Anise, would you introduce yourself? Hello everyone. My name is Anise Bawarshi and I am a um, faculty member in the English department and currently the chair of the department. Um, prior to this, I was uh, the director of the expository writing program and my work uh, focuses primarily around um, writing studies and rhetoric, and uh, especially how um, students uh, learn to write and how writing development works and what writing does in the world. Cool. And where can people find you online if they want to follow up after today's episode? You know, I have a faculty profile on the English department website, um, and you can just find it by typing in my name, Anis, A-N-I-S, Bawarshi, B-A-W-A. R-S-H-I. For everybody listening or watching, we'll have those links in the description below. And the English department now has social media channels if you want to follow us there because we'll post updates about the series. And we now also post updates about what's going on in the English department, which with any being share of the department, that seems especially pertinent to today's episode because there's been some exciting evolutions, I think, in the year of COVID in some ways. So, Anise, what did you bring to talk about with us today? So, I brought a word, uh, the word articulation. Um, it's a word I love. It's a word that I, over the years, have learned is kind of a, an epicenter for, the, for what I'm interested in studying. What I love about the word is that it has a double meaning. In part, it means to express. But at the same time, it also means to conjoin. And uh, what I like about it is that it suggests that what gets expressed depends on what is brought together and how it is brought together. And in my work as a scholar, a teacher, and an administrator, which I've been doing a long time, um, I'm interested in how things are held together in certain ways that make certain things sayable and in turn doable. So I pay a lot of attention to, um, to the in-betweens, you know, the seams, the stitches, the connecting points that makes things on the one hand possible and conversely also difficult to do. So I'm interested in the sites of articulation, you know, the relations that hold together ways of communicating and acting. If you wouldn't mind going more in depth about what you mean by sites of articulation, because what I'm hearing is, mm -hmm. right, and I'm imagining that we have like viewers and listeners who are starting to get what you mean by articulation and sites of might be what helps kind of concretize it a bit, if you don't mind kind of explaining that piece. There's a way in which articulation is um, structured in the, in the institutions, in, in the uh, 
in the context that we exist in, right? There's a lot at stake in making sure that certain articulations occur. We don't want surprises all the time. We don't want new articulations all the time. We've kind of lived through a year of that where everything had to be re-articulated in order to make things work the arena remote um, in under remote conditions. So by sites of articulation, and I, I mean in part the institutional structural spaces that connect things for us through the text that exists, through the you know the the, uh, the habits, uh, the routinizations, the all the ways that certain connections are held together in order to make possible certain expressions, certain actions. So sites of articulation are the spaces that come to us already with connections in place that we just kind of need to uh, mobilize or enact for ourselves. But also sites of articulation are places where things can be uh, reimagined and um, where new combinations of things can be put together to allow for uh, new expressions and new actions. So that's what I, what I mean with my size of articulation. And then I'll give an, kind of an example from my scholarship in, in, in genre theory, because one side of articulation for me are genres. Uh, genres exist in part to make certain articulations possible and recognizable. So, you know, we all kind of understand genres in a popular way as describing types of things, categorizations of things, um, forms, you know, types of things. But that's not the most interesting things about genres for me. Um, the fact that we have names for types of things also means that we have perceptions about and ways of, um, you know, discerning kinds of things. By just for clarification real quick, when you say genre here and you're talking about the popular understanding, you're referring to like the popular understanding of fiction as a genre, poetry as a genre, thriller yeah. films as a genre, right? In your research, articulation allows you to deconstruct that a little bit, pulling at the seams of this disparate categories between genres, right? Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Because if we just think of genre as a type or a, um, you know, a category or a name of something, we, we miss what it holds together that then makes us able to think with it or recognize, recognize it or, uh, or, or the kind of impact it has on us. Right, that, that a genre means something not because we have a name for it, but because it organizes and uh, generates a set of relations that constellate around a particular expression or a feeling or an expectation uh, or an action. So by, by thinking about genres in relation you know, to articulation and asking how do genres help us articulate in the sense that what do they hold together in a certain way with particular stakes in order to make certain experiences and expressions possible? Interesting. So it is a way of deconstructing the genre to understand what it does and how it holds things together to create an experience. It, at the same time, by knowing what it holds together, you're able to better understand what it's sort of refusing to integrate, right? Exactly. So in that sense, Genres are what you might call recognition phenomena because they hold certain things together and in doing so, whether, you know, like, you know, in the most obvious cases, like in the sonnet, certain, you know, syntactically things are held together in a way to make us recognize it and what it's doing. But at the same time, and this is what has made genre study and teaching so fascinating to me is that by holding together 
certain things, genres provide us with possibilities for action. By helping us define and recognize kinds of texts and situations, genres provide us with uh, typified ways of acting um, in them. And so they have this sort of uh, recursive nature where they shape how we, how we understand particular situations and they provide us with the tools for typically acting in them in a recognizable ways. And in so doing, we reinforce those situations as requiring these typical ways of responding. Can you explain how um, this concept of genre, right, as making possible different sets of actions um, through different potential articulations that have to adhere to that recognition, but also mm -hmm. cause us to act, right? Functions and things that we experience in the everyday world. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the things that was a, such a breakthrough in my thinking about genre was that genres don't just respond to recurrence as if recurrence was its kind of natural phenomenon, but they are one of the ways in which we create recurrence because of the way that we respond to things that we perceive as, as occurring again and again, that further, um, that further creates the need for those kinds of responses. So it naturalizes recurrence. And uh, there's a quote by Dylan Dreyer that I think um, gets at this, and then I'll give an example. But the quote is, uh, genres persist because they frame what they permit as that which is poss possible. Okay. Genres persist because they frame what they permit as that which is possible. So there's this, I'll give an example from what I referred to earlier with the employment. The, the need to apply for employment is a recurring event in our society. And to help us respond to this recurrence, we have a set of genres. We, you know, we've developed a set of genres, culturally specific, to help us respond to this recurrence, such as the resumes, cover letters, letters of recommendations, and all the other uh, apparatus. And it's, you know, and it's an interesting thing that genres, the genre of the resume was actually invented in business writing textbooks. There's a great article in the history of the resume by Randall Popkin that discusses all of this. Like, like the genres are started not out of a natural need, but out of a instructional pedagogical guidance that then came to have such a forceful impact in, in the world. So anyway, so if we take the, you know, so these genres that are in place for, for responding to um, the event of applying for employment, they, they help us um, take action in a way that is recognizable and expected. Um, but they also do something more powerful. They structure how we present our experiences, including what experiences qualify, what parts of ourselves we share, and what do we um, don't feel permitted to share about ourselves. And even more powerfully than that, knowing that the resume exists as one of the ways that we apply for and seek employment, many of us begin to shape our lives in ways that prepare us to write the resume. Think about all the people who say, oh, this will be a good resume building. People begin to make choices about what experience they want to accumulate, what opportunities to pursue, what kind of selves to, 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 to kind of uh, build in a way that then helps them write this genre on the terms that are set forth in that genre. And in that way, we begin to embody it. It becomes part of ourselves. It, um, you know, we, we, we take up the genre by taking it in. And um, 
and this performance becomes a performance of ourselves and this rhetorical task. Since then, my work on genre and others' work on genre has um, moved away from attributing agency to genre in the same way. I wouldn't say that genres really do anything. It's more that we do them through genres, but it's not even we do things. I think now that the uptake of genre, the performance of genre is far more complex and distributed. This interest in genre in the way that they play a role in how we recognize and act in situations has always been for me, a great, great appeal. Um, and I think because of this reason, they are worth paying critical attention to um, for the ways that they reproduce and naturalize and articulate uh, certain expressions and actions in our day-to-day -day lives. And that's what I mean by sight of articulation and how they can be disrupted to make, to open space, if for nothing else, to pay attention to how this articulation is being uh, produced. And then to figure out if we wanna put in place possibilities for other kinds of articulations. And one of my great surprises as chair has been how much this understanding and this interest in genre and this interest in articulation uh, how much that has been valuable to the way I approach the work. I think we have a pretty rich understanding and thank you for that. Actually, that was wonderful um, about articulation, genre, these concepts, the friction, right? That they each carry um, as both categories and category makers, uh, so to speak, um, and, and disruptors. What does that have to do with being department chair? <laughs> to ask the basic question. Uh, what does that have to do with anything? Going, like, where, how do we get from that to department chair? You know. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so um, this has actually been one of the sources of um, sustenance for me and uh, made me realize that being an administrator didn't mean this separation from your intellectual and pedagogical life. If you know how to recognize it as intellectual work. Um, and I think I was fortunate enough, partly because my work in genre is not literary. So I've already been trained for years to be understanding how institutional genres work to mobilize uh, language and discourse and actions. This is part of what I study. And um, so the genres that I was now um, immersed in as, a, as an administrator, the, the genres that transact the, the business of the department and the institution were already intellectual uh, sources for me. The, it was an archive that was already intellectual for me. But, you know, it occurred to me that if part of our department's strategic goals, um, intellectual mission is to think about um, how do we conduct our business? And in what ways has that means of conducting our business made possible certain things and prevented other things from being possible. Uh, this is this to me cannot be separated from the events of the last two years that have put into stark recognition for us that some of the inequities that we uh, we live with are there by design, and 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 they're designed that way because of the sites of articulation that exist, right. Um, I'll give something as something fairly innocuous, but the University of Washington uh, was recently named a Carnegie Community Engaged Institution, right? And we celebrate public work and uh, public scholarship. Um, we take pride in the partnership work that we do. And yet our documents, 
the genres that exist um, make it very hard to recognize um, and reward that work. And, um, and if we did not start looking at what kind of articulations these documents were doing, we were gonna create a situation where people still had to use these existing documents to articulate what we valued you know, before. And then they have to do this other work that is rendered invisible. And uh, right, or or less valuable, perhaps, and or less or valuable promotion, secure job security. Correct, correct, and um, yeah. And, so it and, creates this situation where you have to do this, you have to do perform this double labor. Um, um, one so familiar, the, yes, I'm like smiling. The so labor, <laughs> the recognizable labor, the, the labor that is articulated in our system of articulation and uh, the other kind of work that you do because you love it or because you're inherently right. So that is just one example. And so, but I will kind of go with this a little bit further because so we, one of the work, one of the tasks we've been, we, we undertook as a department is to start reviewing our merit and promotion uh, documentation. Um, and thinking about um, not just the uh, the publicly um, the, the publicly marked genres, right? Like, so we know we have to produce annual activity reports. We know we have to write personal statements. We know we have to write promotion reports. The chair writes merit reviews. Those are all documents that are going to exist, right? But if you don't, but these genres will exert a certain force on what you can say and not say. And if you don't put something in, in between them to interrupt or to make new articulations possible, then you are gonna just be relying on either tremendous amount of labor of individuals and mentors and well, let me show you how to, you can do or how to, or you can create um, intermediary genres within this with chain of genres to disrupt. So one of the things we did was we created a uh, merit heuristic. We, we literally we spent um, three months on this. And um, this is work that when Brian, Brian Reed was a chair before me and I was the associate chair, we kind of led it with the executive committee. Um, and um, what we did was we began to do this inventory, the range of work that we do, and think about um, not just inventorying it and then um, creating space for it to be made legible, but also thinking about where it fits because you have this like this holy trinity of service, teaching, and research. But things fall all between those things, right? And if you are, like if you are a, uh, if you're, if, you know, if you're a director of the first year writing program, you know, well, that's sort of that's service, but that's also teaching, yep. and it's also scholarship because you are, you are, it's a side of praxis. You're bringing our, the research on writing into action. Um, so we worked on, you know, we worked on ways to make legible the range of work and then beginning to think about where these things fit in multiple ways so that someone's work doesn't have to be demarcated and, and someone doesn't think, well, when I'm doing my service, it's, it's disconnected from my intellectual life. So we worked on this and we voted up this heuristic document. It's, a, it's what you could think of as an occluded genre. It doesn't get um, submitted anywhere but it is a transactional genre because it helps somebody. So now when we ask people to write their annual activity report or update their CV every year, we remind them to go look in this and it helps disorient, you know, the, the articulations that already exist that separate things to make possible new combinations. And it's been fascinating because as chair, 
I have seen a significant difference in the way people articulate their work as a result of that. For folks listening that aren't like entrenched in academia, what sorts of articulations were very visible beforehand and what are new ways that people are articulating that strike you as very hopeful or exciting or kind of creating new possibilities for validating different types of work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just give a few examples. Um, so one which seems so small in a way, and but you know, like reading each other's manuscripts. Um, if if that belong if that belonged anywhere, people would put it under service. Um, and I mean, reading each other's manuscripts, both kind of peer review, but also just colleagues' work. And um, so that ended up getting sort of peripheralized. And and what that kind of did was it would make people feel like when I when a colleague came to me and asked me to read this work, which is such a wonderful opportunity to create a connection in intellectual community, you would see it as taking away time from doing the other work that is supposed to matter. And so that ended up coming under scholarship. We, we ended up putting that item under scholarship so that somebody who engaged in it and helped create intellectual community and mentor and you know, all of those things could also they and we could recognize it as scholarly work, as work that is advancing uh, what we know. Right, so instead of saying, if you're going to be like an indigenous um, queer woman, you need to adhere to the kind of old school single publication model to uh, kind of attain security, you're saying we will actually want to see a variety of different ways you self-identify your work and what matters to you to continue to thrive in the department. Right, and I mean, there's just so many examples I can give, uh, you know, we just recently had a, the, the third annual Shine Gold Lecture. And to understand that it wasn't what we heard at that event that makes it intellectual. It was the way it was created, the way that it was brought to existence involved care and, um, and atten intellectual attention. And as I mentioned, you're, you know, at the, uh, in the introduction to that, poetics of bringing something into being that we can then experience in a way that bears the, the marks of that poetics. Yeah. So like, it wasn't like we went there to, to, to hear about poetics, yeah. you know, the way we were brought there and the way it was brought to our consciousness had a poetics. And that, you know, when all those who are involved in that and, you know, Ray Paris's coordination of it, that is driving it from the beginning. You know, this is intellectual work. This would not be something that is, well, I'm doing a service. I am, uh, I'm organizing an event. That doesn't come close to getting at it. Or when, um, you know, John Webster has been building the English 108 writing ready course. That, that's a course that has now been in existence for over 10 years. It's, it's supported over, you know, probably by this point, a few thousand students. It's been a subject of several dissertations and, um, and it's informed deeply by scholarship and knowledge transfer and writing development and uh, translingualism, making our, our courses not, I don't like the word incl inclusion, uh, but a place of belonging for a range of epistemologies and ways of you know, modalities um, of communication, right? This is serious intellectual pedagogical work and our hope is that we continue working on changing our, what you can call these transactional documents to allow for this work to have the value. In addition to the obvious uh, value of the scholarship that we do, the traditional scholarship that is still at the heart of what we do. That's not all to discount that, but we can create space for more.